we can understand the mind as being a mirror of nature and the task of philosophy is to like polish that mirror so that we get the most accurate representation of reality in our mind as possible. G'day, everyone. G'day. How you doing? Welcome back to Ideas Matter 2023. 2023. It's going to be a big year for us. Yeah. I'm uh, I'm going to be studying full-time again. Looking forward to that. I'm going to be working full-time. Very busy, but we're still going to be pumping out the content for you. Exactly. We are your loyal slaves. We are servants. Your servants. Now, today we're doing... A short read on pragmatism by William James, who was an American philosopher. Will I am James. Will I am James. Um, But he's also regarded as the father of American psychology, which is interesting. And you'll see sort of as we go through what he says, how a lot of the points he makes are kind of psychological. Also, I should apologize. I'm getting over a cold. So if my voice sounds slightly funny, that's why. But yes, we're reading pragmatism, um, and we both had like different reasons for wanting to do pragmatism. Mine was just that my uh, PhD supervisors are both pragmatists, and I think they're trying to convert me to the Church of Pragmatism, um, and so far they're not doing a good job. Well, Stay strong. William James is not doing a good job. But you wanted to do it because pragmatism via John Dewey has a big influence on educational philosophy, right? Yeah, pretty much the main line of educational philosophy, uh, at least in Western countries, is what's called progressive education. And all of it pretty much feeds through John Dewey um, and pragmatism. Uh, So reading Will I Am... Uh, (laughs) I I said it seriously. (laughs) (laughs) Reading William James... um, I feel like is a good way to sort of get to the core of what pragmatism is about. Yeah, because um, this is one of the first pragmatic texts. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Um, and, and this is sort of the, from what I can tell, the clearest uh, exposition of its core tenets. So, yeah, no, it was quite interesting to, for me to read, but we'll, yeah. we'll get into that as we go on. So as I was saying to Alex before we started recording, I think the best way to understand pragmatism is to sort of understand the view of philosophy that they're responding to and trying to reject. And so the big thing about pragmatism is its view of truth. Um, It's got a pragmatic answer to what is truth, what is true. And so the best way to understand that is to contrast it with the sort of dominant view in philosophy. And I'd sort of take this description from a later pragmatic text, Richard Rorty's Philosophy and the Mirror of Nature, which I read in my undergraduate Um, And so Rorty talks about how philosophy sort of sees its task as we can understand the mind as being a mirror of nature. And the task of philosophy is to like polish that mirror so that we get the most accurate representation of reality in our mind as possible. And so the view of truth that that is, that is underpinning that is that this will be very familiar to those of you who've read any Plato or listened to our episodes on Plato. There's this dichotomy in reality between appearance and reality. So things appear to us a certain way through the senses, uh, but the actual matter or substances that are giving off those attributes, uh, they might be different in reality than as they appear to us. And so the task of philosophy is to try and get as close as we can, if not see things in themselves to understanding reality as it is. Um, So this fundamental distinction between appearance and reality is running right through Western philosophy and Kant talks about it. He calls it the noumenon and the phenomenon. Um, And even you can sort of see the distinction even in scientific language. I mean, this idea of what is most real kind of gets replaced with like objective reality, what is most objective. It's just the very simple idea that the way things appear to us through the senses might not reflect the way things, quote, actually are. And the task of philosophy is, in its least modest form, to grasp things as they actually are, 
but in a more modest form um, to just try and set up the cognitive framework through which we can best approximate reality. And so that's why Rorty uses the term mirror of nature. The mind is like a mirror that's reflecting reality. And the way I spun the phrase in my undergraduate essay was like the task of the philosopher is to like clean that mirror. And that's like what Kant tries to do. It's what later philosophers of mind, it's what epistemologists try to do with theories of knowledge. We're just trying to get this like foundational cognitive framework for how we can study reality. But the important part for the pragmatists is that like, the truth of the matter, this reality that we're trying to understand, it exists independently of our mind. It is just a matter of fact. It's like inert. It's out there. Whether we look at it or not, truth is just the truth, regardless of whether we have any knowledge of it. And that's what the pragmatists are reacting against. Uh, they don't think that like the real world is out there fixed and we go and discover it and something that's true now is true in 2,000 years or true 2,000 years ago. They have a much more like symbiotic view of truth between the mind and what the mind comes to know. There's a bit more of an interplay between the two. So they're pushing back on this like hard distinction that you find in uh, most Western philosophy. Damn. That's a very good rundown of pragmatism. <laughs> that would. See you later, folks. <laughs> Our shortest episode. <laughs> but yeah, as you can see, it's quite a paradigm shift uh, in terms of the things that the way philosophy approaches things because you know it's not focused on looking at eternal things absolute things it's how do things work in the here and now that that is that should be that ought to be the focal points for all philosophical question yeah hence hence the term pragmatic um, which has a sort of run of the mill pedestrian connotation which in this case is not really that far off the mark from what it means in the philosophical context um it it, it is like something is true if it is pragmatically or practically useful. Mm. Um, and that's, that's their, to foreshadow a bit, that's what they think truth is. Um, but we'll unpack that more. But the, the way that this book is structured, really, it's, not, it's, a, it's a transcript of a bunch of lectures that he gave, I think, in 1906 um, in the United States, where he outlines pragmatism. It's called Pragmatism, uh, A New Name for Some Old Ways of Thinking. So there's about eight lectures. Uh, it's pretty short. I'd say it comes to around 100, just over 100 pages maybe, depending on the book. Um, but the first lecture is quite good. I, I liked it. And he says something, he opens with this phrase that you don't often hear where he says that the history of philosophy is to a great extent that of a certain clash of temperaments. And what he means by this is that whether you're what he calls a rationalist or an empiricist, your basic worldview, what you take to be salient, is to a certain extent biased just by who you are as a person, your sort of temperament. Um, so what he calls empiricists like tough-minded and rationalists are tender-minded. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, like you, like a thinker's character biases their thought to like a massive degree. And he sets up this sort of dichotomy of like, psychological and thereby philosophical profiles where on the one hand there's the rationalistic sort of person who's like you know uh re rejects the idea that you can come to know reality through you know sense data and experience you know you can work this out rationally and they tend to be um rather optimistic rather religious have have all of these sorts of connotations but he labels them tender-minded, which I think is a giveaway as to his opinion. Yeah. Uh, because the other one, uh, the empiricist sort, you know, very hard, hard-nosed, hard based on sceptical, based on empirical data, you know, what can we gather through the senses? What evidence can we gather? And through that, we can uh, come to knowledge of the world. Those are tough-minded people. Which is really, if you know the like the Virgin versus Chad memes, yeah. Like it, later on, he'll be like, "I don't know why the rationalists dislike me so much." Where he, at the start, he opens up with like pretty much the equivalent of Virgin rationalists versus Chad empiricists. Pretty, yeah, <laughs> pretty much. He just he shits on rationalists throughout the entire throughout the entire book, like calling them sterile. <laughs> 
<laughs> and he's like, well, I don't understand why they think I don't like them. <laughs> I don't know, James. <laughs> yeah. But there's, I know I say this in pretty much every single one of our pods now, but there's a lot of nature in this. And for, for William James, that is actually a very apt comparison. Like this whole idea that, you know, a thinker's contributions or like someone's thought is an expression of their will and their expression of will is shaped by their character. Mm. Like it's not like they've just come to some truth that was out there in the universe. Like who they are determines what they think and these like massive, you know, grand rationalist systems like you'd see in like, I don't know, like Spinoza or like Kant or something. Yeah. That's that's an expression of that person's own character, not not like a one hundred percent representation of the world, yeah. At, at least per per their view. Yeah, no, I, I actually really liked this um, because I, I think it's true, and I think he's right in saying that it's a huge bias that's not actually spoken about in philosophy because philosophers like to think of themselves as being like perfectly objective and rational and only believing the things that they can logically prove or logically show. <laughs> but that's just not the case. Just to a large extent, it's, it's personality based. Mm. And I had had a similar thought when it comes to politics. Mm -hmm. Um, To to, to a large extent, like, whether you're a radical or not, it really just depends on your temperament. Yeah. I mean, like, if if I were to go and talk to some radical left-wing person on the street, I'm sure we'd agree on quite a lot. And then they'd be like, well, well, do you want to come to this, like, rally and chant, like, fuck the capitalist pigs or whatever? I'm like, well, no, I don't want to do that. Like, that's just... To a large extent, it's just it's personality based. It's temperament. Like I don't have that. I don't have a radical temperament. Yeah, um, I remember you saying to me like a year or two ago, that, um, critical theory is a personality type. Yeah, which it, I think is very apt. It is a personality type, and like being pessimistic about things. I mean, so people will take bits of news and focus on different things based on their, like, underlying temperament. They'll be like, oh, I'm optimistic about this, or they'll have a very pessimistic reading of this, and that informs their politics. Um, and, again, this is, a, this, is a, this is a point that conservatives make. Um, Michael Oakeshott said that being conservative is a disposition. It's just a simple disposition and aversion to, like, a radical change. It's not actually, like, a rational political theory. It's more of a disposition. Mm. So yeah. I, I have seen a paper that um, shows a strong correlation between having dyed blue hair, like, <laughs> or like unnatural dyed hair, having mental illness and uh, strong left-wing political beliefs. Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> I mean, but no, but it's like to a certain extent, I mean, I'm not knocking those beliefs because I probably share a lot of them, but like the portrayal of yourself as like a rebel mm. on the outside of the mainstream I'm, what I'm saying is like that probably has more to do with your underlying personality than the actual content of your political worldview. Yeah, like you didn't start out as like a straight laced, like you know, complete button down person. Yeah, and then you, I don't know, you read critical theory, or like you had like a Marx reading. Yeah, in uni, and you're like, oh, I'm going to completely change who I am. Yeah, actually, I'm going to join Extinction Extinction Rebellion. Yeah. Like, no, you were already, like, personality predisposed to want to do that. Mm. So I think that's a good point. And as I said earlier, like, he, he's a psychologist, so he sort of has these psychological readings of things, which I think can be quite useful. Um, but the point of this first lecture is to set up w- w- the void that he sees pragmatism as filling. And so he says, on the one hand, you've got these rationalists, um, and on the other hand, you've got these empiricists, and this sort of seems like a distinction that most people or people in the middle are fairly unhappy with. Because if you become a full blown empiricist, you're too hard headed, you're too you're too materialistic, and sort of a materialistic reading of the world can be a little bit, I don't know, like bereft of meaning. Yeah, I think like the stereotypical like hard nosed atheist. Yeah, like, like if you're someone who's like in the least bit of a uh, rationalist temperament, you encounter that and you think, Christ, that's pretty depressing. Legit. Um, like a, like a, someone who would say, oh, love is just a chemical in the brain. Yeah. Something like that. I mean, that's technically true, but that's sort of like a hard-headed materialist worldview is a bit deflationary of these other aspects of human existence that we think are valuable. But on the other hand, what he describes as rationalism, and I think he's strawmanning a bit here, but on the other hand, he says of, of rationalism, um, 
and I think he's straw manning slightly. He says, if you escape the materialism that goes with the reigning empiricism, you pay for that escape by losing contact with the more concrete parts of life. So I think, like, the idea is here, like, people who read all this Kant and Hegel and Descartes, sounds great, but what does that have to do with anything with real life? Mm. Um, so he's got this kind of, like, depressing materialistic philosophy on the one hand versus this completely head-in-the-clouds abstract philosophizing on the other. He goes, well, most people want something in the middle mm. that reconciles both of what's good about either. Yeah. And that, my friends, is what he sees as the role of pragmatism. Mm. And before we end out, at least on the first lecture, he, uh, towards the end, says, the finally victorious way of looking at things will be the most completely impressive to the normal run of minds. So there is a really strong democratic instinct here. Um, what most people will be most naturally geared towards is going to be the, in a sense, truest way of things. Yeah, democratic. And does that feed into, like, Dewey's education, educational philosophy? Yeah, 100%. It's, um, the idea is of people sort of constructing knowledge and constructing meaning together, like, you know, community of, community of teaching and learning. But there's... Right. Right. Sounds like something Jordan Peterson would hate. Yeah. <laughs> no I, I hated it. I think it's bullshit and doesn't work at all, but yeah. we can do an episode on that I, at some point. I, I tend to agree with you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I wonder why we keep falling in the uh, international <laughs> rankings as we uh, <laughs> keep instituting that in the curriculum. Mm, who knows? Um, but yeah, it also sounds like Rorty. So like Rorty takes James's theory of truth, which is what is true is what is practically useful. And he says, actually, the role of philosophy is to just, like, create the broadest possible scope for, like, intersubjective agreement. Like, if we can just reconcile our differences, that's pragmatically, that's good. And whatever does that is, in a certain sense, true. Um, so, yeah, e interesting that you... I didn't think of that, but <clears throat> it makes a lot of sense. There is a sort of a democratic impulse that's, that's going under all of this. Um, but lecture two is okay. Uh, it, he's really just sort of saying, he's sort of fleshing a bit more detail what he means by pragmatism. Like, yeah, what is the pragmatic method? Yeah, so he says two things. Like, A, it's really just a method and it's a theory of truth. And if you take those two things, then you're, you're a pragmatist. Um, and the pra but, but he does say that one doesn't rely on the other. You can accept the method and reject the theory of truth. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. I missed that bit, but that makes my reading of him slightly more sympathetic. <laughs> um, but the, his method is like, if, you, if you, we think of a philosophical debate, um, perhaps like, is the universe all just in the mind of God or is it material? Or did God create the universe or was it just the Big Bang came out of nothing? Something like that. He says that... Um, we should take both sides' answers to that problem and this is only a real problem if there's a, an actual real-world consequence of one of these positions being true. If it doesn't matter to in the quote-unquote real world if one position is true or the other, then this is not something that we should be spending our time talking about. It is, yeah. it is of no consequence. Uh, so he it's sort of deflationary. It's like, well, all of this argumentation, unless the, unless one side you can show why your reason, if I change my mind on this, why it would impact our lives, unless you can do that, then this is just a waste of time. Hmm. And I am quite sympathetic to that with a lot of issues, though I'm, sel I'm selective with my sympathy of it because there are some things that I am very interested in that... Yeah, like probably don't have any sort of pragmatic consequence either way. But there are other topics like, I don't know, like are we in a simulation <laughs> or like is free will real? And it's like I, I, I hear questions like that and philosophical disputes like that. And I think like literally what, like what does it matter either way? It seems like an intellectual exercise. Yeah, I don't know. I, this, this to me really rubbed me the wrong way because it sort of reminds me of people who say things like, um, 
why do we put money into like space research mm. when we still have homeless people? Yeah. And my my problem with that is is that it sort of presumes that you can know what the consequences of something are. Now, to give like a, a less run-of-the-mill example, um, it would have been to the pragmatist completely immaterial to go back to ancient Greece and be like, well, is Democritus right or is someone else right about atoms? To them, the question of is the world made up of atoms or not was completely non-consequential. Inconsequential, sorry. Um, because it would have made no practical difference to them. But as it turns out, the world is made up of atoms, and Democritus was right. Um, so it, my problem with pragmatism is that, like, they would be forced to say that, like, that's a meaningless debate or that it's not true either way because it makes no practical difference. But that's not the case, in my opinion. They just didn't know the practical consequences yet. Right, but in in defense of pragmatism, I feel like a pragmatist would say, yes, and that's the beauty of the pragmatist project because something can be not true at one point and then later become true because we found out more about it and then it suddenly becomes useful to us, which is simultaneously a flaw because if it wasn't true back then, why is it all of a sudden true now? Wouldn't something like that hold yeah. in being true? But it, I do see it as sort of a a self-correcting method, if not in a completely satisfactory way. Yeah, I mean, a lot of whether you agree with pragmatism or not is whether you just instinctively accept this idea of, like, truth is whether or not we can have an accurate representation of reality in our mind, and reality is, is as it is regardless. And so, obviously, the universe was made up of atoms in ancient Greece just because they couldn't prove it empirically, doesn't mean it wasn't true. Um, And that's just, that to me just is a perfectly logical thing to say. But my other problem with it is, and again, the pragmatist would just dismiss this, but like philosophy in a certain sense precedes, it's prior to science. And a lot of people would disagree with this, but like I, I accept the view of philosophy as like being the cognitive tip of the spear. Yeah, like it it frames the thought in which scientific work happens. Exactly. And so to have a metaphysics which presupposes atoms might lead you to then go and look for them and discover they exist. Yeah. And so for the pragmatist to shut something down by saying, well, this is just useful because we don't know whether it's true or not, I think you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater and it's just, a, it's to me it's a bit like, it's just a lot of hubris because you don't, you don't know. You don't know what the value of these things is going to be. And there's a there's a value in doing things just for their own sake. And ironically, in doing that, they end up having practical consequences later on anyway, if that makes sense. I Yeah, look, I, I get what you're saying and I agree with what you're saying, but I, I still feel as if like the, the pragmatists can take that criticism and be like, yeah, completely true. And that pragmatism still works because it's able to account for that change in circumstances from a thing being inconsequential to being consequential. So then it just has gone from being not true to being true. We have revealed the truth through revealing this thing as being consequential. Yeah, and to a certain extent, like, the only thing that I can respond to that is, like, just a semantic objection. Yeah. Whereas, like, no, you didn't you didn't become true, it always was true. Yeah. Um, and so when you mentioned before we started recording, like Thomas Kuhn structure of scientific revolutions, mm. and that's an apt example because what is really going on here is like the pragmatist is kind of stepping outside this paradigm and arguing against it. And every, every time someone like me tries to object to the pragmatist, I'm doing so with one foot still in the paradigm that the pragmatist is just rejecting. So they can always just say, well, you're, you're assuming X mm. and I assume that away. And so there's a there's a sort of incommensurability between the two worldviews. Yeah. And, you know, ironically, James is right that perhaps to a large extent your personality will dictate whether you find this intuitively, you know, realistic or not. Mm. Yeah. Look, I, there, there are parts of pragmatism, uh, at least as James presents it, that I find compelling and convincing and otherwise agree with. But... Yeah, as a whole, I think there are a lot of 
things that I, I I just can't fully agree with. I can't wholesale buy into the project. And well, actually, we'll get into this later later on in this when he gets on to like uh, pragmatism and humanism and pragmatism and religion. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like he doesn't, he's not satisfactory on pragmatism when he gets to those parts yeah. and it's relationship to other things that aren't necessarily pragmatic. So we've gone over the pragmatic methods. So like you settle philosophical disputes by interpreting each, each notion in a dispute by tracing its respective practical consequences. So if there's no practical difference, the dispute doesn't really matter. It doesn't exist. You know, it's just sort of like a, a semantic game. Um, what is the pragmatic theory of truth? So we've yeah. had the methods. What's the theory of truth? I mean, so I sort of we sort of started talking about this earlier before, and my views on this are, are quite obvious. But he says that uh, an idea is true insofar as it helps us get into satisfactory relationship with other parts of our experience. So what the hell does that mean? So. Uh, the, pr- the pragmatist like turns away from these like abstract questions and just looks at like what we're actually doing in the real world, our experiences and our actions with other people. Um, he says the pragmatist turns towards actions. And so if you think about yourself going about the world and you're running into people, you're running into objects, you're having to navigate things, a belief is true if in holding that belief, it it, it sort of enables a sort of smoother... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for, a smoother interface between yourself and everything around you. Because everyone has a stock of beliefs in their mind that they already believe. And if this new idea comes along and it is fundamentally irreconcilable with everything else that you believe, and if you were to adopt that belief, your entire life would be turned upside down and nothing would work, well, that's probably not something that you're going to believe. It's probably not going to be true. Um, But... Something is true if this belief comes along and it, it enables you to reconcile your pre-existing beliefs and stock of knowledge with your day-to-day experiences. So he says, quote, to be true uh, means only to perform a marriage function between outstanding beliefs and new facts. And he calls this a genetic theory of truth. So when we discover a new fact about the world, psychologically what we have to do is we have to sort of integrate that new fact with what we already believe, what we already know. Um, and a belief is true if it satisfactorily does that integration for us. And so, again, we can come back to, like, Kuhn's idea of scientific revolutions here and as a, as a good way of explaining this. I mean, this is how paradigms work in science for, for Kuhn. We discover facts about the world, and if our dominant scientific paradigm can accommodate it, all good. We keep doing, quote-unquote, normal science. If it can't, we... Perhaps we dismiss the fact. We say it's not relevant, it's not salient. But the more of those facts that build up that we can't explain in the paradigm, then eventually you're going to have a paradigm shift. You're going to have a scientific revolution and you're going to change. So what James is describing here to me just sort of seems like normal science. And I I think it is psychologically true. I mean, that is how we go about the world. Like if you, you say to anyone a certain fact about, I'm just going to default to politics because that's what I know most about hey, this political party did X. If you like that political party, you're going to try and reconcile it in a way that sort of justifies what they did. If you don't like them, you take it as evidence of like, yep, I always knew they were horrible, etc. You just integrate it into your pre-existing stock of beliefs. So I think psychologically it's true. But to say that like the phrase to be true of an idea or of a belief means only its capacity to perform this marriage function I don't know. I mean, that's not... I hold to the mm. classic philosophical idea of truth, but that's just me. Yeah, so it's it, it's true in as much as human experience is concerned, but it's not. it doesn't describe truth as such. Yeah. Mm. But they would say, well, what the fuck is truth as such? Like, that's just a... The pragmatist just doesn't, <laughs> doesn't buy that worldview. And I don't know, fair enough, I guess, but yeah. Mm. Yeah, so... Yeah, even for the idea of truth as such, the the pragmatist uh, would say, well, that's just uh, a construction. That's just you semantically replacing the entire like enormity of all 
reality of all sense experience of everything there is to know and experience and, and feel and think in the world and instead of reconciling yourself with all of that sort of like flux of data and creating a using like a pragmatic theory of uh pragmatic method and pragmatic pragmatic theory of truth to kind of align yourself most properly with that you're just collapsing all of that with the word truth or the absolute or god yeah, and yeah. through doing so the you you sort of like swept it under the rug as far as they they're concerned and you then build a sort of like philosophical edifice around this semantic abstraction based on this and also i'm sympathetic to nature very much and he has a similar view um uh i i'm sympathetic to the psychology of this but despite that i'm not convinced that it yeah describes the world as such but then again as such is th- too, those are the words that the pragmatist too, would uh we're too take ca- offense with we're too platonic and cartesian we're just really clinging to that like well this describes how the mind works but like the mind is not the world like we're, <laughs> we're just really clinging to that like fundamental distinction uh which i think is justified um look man i just love platonic mysticism yeah <laughs> me too look i don't know i think to be charitable, and again, like he's a psychologist, if you take the example of like mental illness, so technically speaking, like you're not mentally unwell unless it impacts your ability to function in your day-to-day life and in the broader community. And so really like our definition of what is mentally unwell is not, it, it, it's not like referring to some objective fact, like if you have X trait, there's something broken or defective with you. Like that's not really what it's saying. It's like you don't you don't function in our in our social mores in our culture, um, and so that's a more, more pragmatic view. Mm. Um, I, yeah, I I think that's that's a real strong point of pragmatism. Um, yeah, like you can think back to I don't know religious history, and there'd be people having you know, visions and able to commune with God and whatnot. And uh, nowadays we would probably put them in a mental asylum and say, you have no use whatsoever in society. Yeah. Whereas back then people would like travel from all around the kingdom to see this person and be able to catch a bit of their divine inspiration. Yeah. And you w- wouldn't have thought of those people as quote unquote mentally unwell. Mm. They wouldn't have c- conceived of themselves as being mentally unwell. So it is to an extent, yes, a social construction. Um, so, yeah, I think we're both sympathetic to the psychological element of pragmatism. Mm. It does explain, it is a very accurate account of what's going on psychologically when we talk about these things. Um, but, yeah, reality as such. Does it explain reality as such? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess this is, there's, there's a dichotomy at play here between like what you might call like the standard philosophical position versus the pragmatic one of what sort of comes first, the world or the human mind? Yeah. Because by the standard philosophical one, like the world comes first. And like you said, Rorty, we um, we try to get the clearest representation of the world in our mind. Whereas for James, you'd say, no, you're... I, I don't know that you put it as it's say, it's, say it's symbiotic. Yeah, symbiotic. It's it's not that one comes first. It's actually they're like fundamentally co-constituted, mm. and they're in this like back and forth relationship, which I mean, interestingly is I mean this is the part of pragmatism I'm most sympathetic to, uh, and it, it is the part of pragmatism that, that was recommended to me by a previous academic uh, as being the most similar in the Western tradition to Chinese philosophy. Um, and this is incidentally a great segue to lecture three because lecture three, he's like, he's all right, let's let's apply this pragmatic method to um, a debate in philosophy about whether or not the universe is fundamentally materialistic or whether it's spiritualistic or like rationalistic. And so he, he describes materialism as being not whether the world is made up of matter, but rather like a causal explanation. So materialism is can we understand and explain higher phenomena in terms of lower phenomena. So to give an example, like you look at some phenomenal experience like a waterfall 
how do you account for the way the water moves, how it cascades, etc.? On the materialist worldview, you can explain that higher level phenomena just by talking about the positions in space and time of all the different water molecules. And even deeper than that, you could talk about the atoms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It will get harder to do as you go down, but theoretically you can get to a low enough level where you can just bootstrap yourself back up again and you can explain reality in all its complexity from these very small, basic, low-level elements. That, to William James, is the crux of a materialistic worldview, whereas what he calls spiritualism and what I'm going to refer to as like rationalism is you explain the lower in terms of the higher, and this might be like Berkeley or Hegel. So like for Hegel, history is geist or spirit working itself out through the tangible, trying to realise its own freedom. So you explain the particulars of like human history and events in reference to what is higher than them. And so this is sometimes called monism, the priority of the whole, or top-down causation in metaphysics. You can see this at work in Marx as well. In Marx, yeah, well, exactly. Marx takes it from Hegel, right? History is working itself out, trying to reach this higher destination. It's not this bottom-up process. Um, and so James, <laughs> he goes, well, this debate's just completely aesthetic. Like, what difference does it make about whether one of these... It's true or not. Um, and I, my notes is furiously just me, like, completely disagreeing. But later he goes on to say, well, actually, like, maybe there is a practical or pragmatic benefit to believing in one of these because he says that the spiritualist view, the sort of Hegelian or rational or religious view, gives people comfort. It gives people psychological comfort because it's not this, like, the universe is meaningless. Uh, it's just this atoms just smashing into each other and there's absolutely no meaning. This idea that there might be a purpose to history uh, gives people some sort of reassurance and comfort. And so insofar as that is the case, uh, the pragmatist might say, well, then that's true, or at least it's true to believe, hmm. um, which yeah, is an interesting way of just wriggling out of, <laughs> of the debate. Yeah, I'm, I'm at two minds about that point because... I, I I can see how he's trying to like extend the other branch, being like, you know, spirituality has like deep like emotional and like well, spiritual significance to people, and that's important in and of itself. You know, that's not something that can be dismissed. But on the other hand, it feels like he's by trying to sort of chart this middle point between rationalism and empiricism, he's going like, okay, we can accept that they can have their silly little belief. Um, as long as it makes you happy. Yeah, it, it's, yeah, it does sound very paternalistic. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that it, it, it ultimately is self defeating, which again is a criticism that the pragmatist wouldn't, wouldn't care for. But I'm going to make it anyway. Um, it, it, I, I wrote in my notes that like this view of truth pulls the rug out from underneath itself because a belief gives us comfort because we think it's objectively true. Like, if you convince yourself that the universe does have a purpose, that say, like, everything is in God's hands and will be taken care of, you can't just choose to believe it because if you believed it, you'd feel comforted. You have to actually think it is in some sense objectively the case, whether you believe it or not. And once you come to that realisation, you get these second-order benefits that he's talking about. So you can't... It's almost like in being a pragmatist, you don't get the pragmatic benefits. It's, it's, it's sort of an irony, if that, if that makes sense. Yeah. It, it, this really feels like a view of philosophy and view of reality for people who try to stand outside of it. You know, I, look, I'm sympathetic to the ways in which this actually you know, can pan out in the lives of people like even if you think to like religious philosophy, you know, the idea of um, Pascal's wager is a Catholic philosopher from like the 1600s. And he said, well, how, if, how do we know God exists? You, you can't really, per Pascal, you don't actually have any proof that he exists, but what are the benefits from acting if he were to exist? Well, you live a holy life. And then if he does exist, then you go to heaven afterwards, and if he doesn't exist, then, you know, whatever, you just, you lived a good life. 
And if you live as if God doesn't exist and you do whatever you want, then if he didn't exist, uh, then whatever, you'll just die anyway. But if he does exist, you go to hell for eternity. Uh, so you might as well, even if you don't really believe it, you might as well act as if he does exist. But wouldn't like, I mean, didn't, didn't Augustine say something like this? And he, he said like, well, God knows if you don't actually believe in mm. God. And so like, you're not going to get to the gates of heaven and be able to trick, mm. <laughs> trick the creator. <laughs> like, I don't know. It just doesn't work for me. Like you have to actually believe it. And actually believing comes from whether or not you think it is a correct description of reality. Mm. I don't know. You're not good. Look, I did, I did four years of analytic philosophy in my formative years. Like you're not going <laughs> to, he's not going to pull me out of it now. I'd be in a certain sense admitting that I wasted four years. <laughs> so I don't know. Pragmatically speaking, I'm not going to just, I'm not going to agree with this, <laughs> but no, like another problem I have with this theory of truth is to say that like something's true. If it's useful presupposes what is, what is useful. Like, what, that term means nothing. Um, and I can't remember who I got this little pithy quote from, but someone said, means are logically subservient to ends. You can't say something is a quote-unquote good or effective or practical means for doing something until you know what your end is. And what your end is, and indeed what your end should be, is the task for philosophy. Um, you can't say something is practical until you know what you're actually trying to achieve. Right. I mean... Like, we drove here today. Was that practical? It was practical in the sense of, like, saving time and not being out in the heat. But it was impractical for, like, my budget and the environment. And maybe if my goal was to be fit, maybe I would have ridden a bike. Like, you can't say something is not inherently practical or not. It depends entirely on what you're trying to achieve. And for me, that's always been the point of philosophy is, well, what should you be trying to achieve? Mm. That's, that's, that's philosophy. Yeah, but a pragmatist might say, w- we can work that out pragmatically as well. But like, okay, but it, yeah, how? I, how? I, know. <laughs> I just it, don't. It seems like every sort of pragmatist response is just like an infinite regress. Yeah. Because like he, he says like the pragmatist's sort of view of the world, it's not like there's a core there's no core on which everything leans. There's just a bunch of different experiences and thoughts leaning on each other with nothing in the middle. But that, I mean, like my, my instinctive, my instinctive, (laughs) my instinctual reaction to that is to say, well, that's just sort of like an infinite regress. Like you're defining reality by a sort of like loop of everything else it's related to. Mm. with no point at which the buck stops. Yeah, I agree. It, it, it is an infinite regress. But again, the pragmatist will just wriggle out of that. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the problem, for those of you familiar with, like, the philosophy of science, you could say that, like, the problem with pragmatism is it's not falsifiable. It doesn't give you a metric by which you could say it's not true. Each theory of truth is, by its own definition, true. And so you can never really argue against it. Um, and so, for, for like, in science, that would just be a horrible theory. Um, but I don't know. The pragmatists seem to be able to get away with it. it. It is very sharp rhetorically. Yeah. Like, they're able to wriggle their way out of a lot of things. They're able to break down a lot of opposing opinions. But I don't know. I, I'm not too sure how much more than that <laughs> I find in there. Yeah. I, I, I like the turn towards experience. I like the turn towards action. Mm. And we'll, we'll get to this in one of the later lectures. I think it's the one on humanism about how everything is like infected with some human element. Uh, I, I think there's a lot to that. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I don't know. So far, I'm not a huge fan. Yeah, fair. All right. So that's the metaphysical problems. There are, um, There is one more lecture uh after that one on uh the idea of like the one and the many yeah so like this is like monism versus pluralism is re- is reality itself is it composed of one thing in many different forms and instantiations or is it a plurality of things is there one is there many doesn't he end up saying that like 
I don't know, I think I wrote this quote about that, of the practical difference that these theories make, pragmatism must equally abjure between absolute monism and absolute pluralism. Yeah. He's like, yeah, it's just in the middle, bro. Yeah, I, I get what you mean when you said this is like just philosophical centrism. <laughs> yeah, it's... If you want to find the truth, just look in the middle. Yeah. Minds collide and the truth is found in the middle. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, that one, I, I really didn't like that lecture. Yeah, no, neither did I. Uh, so much so that I didn't even give it its own heading in my notes. I just went from lecture three to lecture five. <laughs> I was like, oh, no, fuck this. Like, yeah. Also, I think he just repeated himself quite a lot from the third lecture anyway, where he talks about the difference between materialism and spiritualism. Yeah, there's a lot of repetition in this. Yeah. It's a bit unpragmatic of him. Um Lecture five. Common sense. Common sense. You said you liked this one, right? Yeah, yeah. I thought I thought it was quite interesting. Um because he sets up three different ways of coming to knowledge about the world. So there's what he would say like the common sense way. So that's like the the way that's I don't know, like old modes of thought that persist through, like purposefully or not, like through generations. It's sort of like folk knowledge, generational uh, cultural knowledge about the world and about people. Um, and he sets that up against philosophical knowledge and as well sets that up against scientific knowledge. So there's three different ways we can come to knowledge about the world and what philosophers usually do or what scientists usually do is reject all the others at the expense of the one they feel most sympathetic to. Mm. But what James says is, no, there is actual epistemic value in each of these approaches. You know, common sense knowledge works uh, and is valuable in as much as it kind of like helps you go through the world. And philosophical knowledge works in as much as it helps you go through the world and scientific knowledge works and helps in as much as it helps you go through the world. Um, you can't really set one up as being like fundamentally superior to the other. Yeah, that's true. Um, and he, he says towards the end of, of this lecture that um, you can only judge each of these different modes of knowledge through according to their uses. And so you, you, it would be a, it would be a mistake to to judge quote unquote common sense according to philosophy or according to scientific thought uh, because that's just not what what it's designed to do. Um, oh, look, I'm sympathetic to this on some level. It's kind of like sort of it's like sort of sounds like Wittgenstein, mm-hmm. like we're like we're just playing like language games. And the rules of the language game, like, make something true in that language game. And so when we're talking about philosophy, it's true within that discourse, but it's not true in, like, a common sense discourse, and you can't necessarily adjudicate between the two of them. Um, Yeah, cool, I guess. (laughs) Um, I don't know. I don't really see there being that much of a fundamental... I don't, like, see there being a wall between these, like, modes of knowledge. Mm. Um, Like... What is commonsensical is is informed by the other two, for example. Like, what's common sense to us was, would certainly not have been common sense to someone even 100 years ago, maybe mm. not even 50 years ago, right? Like, we, we sort of absorb things like modes of thought that are picked up on or discovered or whatever, what have you, and we they, we absorb them and they become common sense. So I don't think that they're, they're these, like, separate things. And he kind of, like, says that. He's sort of talking about how... Um, we like inherit modes of thought, mm. which I thought was quite interesting. Yeah, he, um, he's got a good quote. Um, Our fundamental ways of thinking about things are discoveries of exceedingly remote ancestors, which have been able to preserve themselves throughout the experience of all subsequent time. Yeah, and yeah, does he give the example of like seeing things as objects, like might have just been an accident? of the evolution of psychology, like we could have seen the world, we could have like sliced up the world in a different sort of way, but we come to talk about the world in terms of like objects and then the pragmatic, the pragmatist would just say, well, but I guess that proved to be useful. So it, it stuck around. Mm. And so in that, only in that sense, is it true that we, that we look at the world in terms of objects? Um, 
I don't know. It's interesting. It could be true. Yeah. I look. I I just enjoyed not even so much on like a like a sharp, you know, hard headed philosophical level. Um, I just I, I I enjoy the um, recuperation of common sense knowledge, uh, which is something that you don't usually see in philosophical discourse. Mm. Yeah, fair enough. I just thought it was nice. <laughs> <laughs> it made me feel good. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening, folks. This is what, you, this is what you're listening for. <laughs> what makes Alex feel good? <laughs> I uh, like this part because um, <laughs> it, it made me happy. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, like legit, I'm going to leave this in here because it's just so funny. Um, I remember like there was a student election at university a couple of years ago and I was talking to this guy out of sheer pity. Oh, I just felt sorry for him because I'd been there and done that. And he literally said to me, he was like, yeah, in our student political group, um, we we bind, which just means that like once they decide on a view, they all share that view and they all have to vote the same way, which strategically might be a great thing to do. But he said that, like, he liked it because it made him feel good because no one disagreed with him. <laughs> I mean, look, that's a remarkable bit of honesty. Yeah, I'm going to give him props for that. I just looked at him and I was like, you're at university, man. <laughs> like, what the fuck? It's like, I like it because it makes me feel warm. <laughs> <laughs> and his yeah. name was... No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, i got to give it props. You know, most people, one wouldn't even be conscious of, of that about themselves and two wouldn't then admit that about themselves. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. At least he's being like, yeah, look, I just like it. It makes me feel nice that yeah. no one disagrees with me. Yeah, legit. <laughs> Which you're right is is true of much more people than they're willing to admit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let's move on then to lecture six, pragmatism's conception of truth, which... He, he tends to repeat himself a lot because um, he did mention this in lecture two, but uh, at least we can, you know, hash it out a bit further here. So lecture six, pragmatism's conception of truth. And again, he sets this out against the idea of like a true idea must copy its reality. Yeah. So he, he agrees with the like standard phrase that truth is the agreement of an idea with reality. But he, what he doesn't agree with is that a true idea must copy it's reality. There's a difference between agreements and copying, mm-hmm. right? So, like, you copy something outside of yourself. You do not constitute that which is copied. You go, but that in that conception, like truth, it's not like truth is like an inert, static thing that's just out there in like the standard conception. Yeah, um, which he doesn't agree with you know he says true ideas are those that can be assimilated validated corroborated and verified false ideas are those that can't so like truth's not like a stagnant property of some idea like it happens to an idea like something becomes true it's it's verification it's verity is an event or a process and then what 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 do we mean by like validation or like verification when it comes to pragmatism but it's like the process by which an idea is led through other parts of experience that are in agreement with our original ideas. Yep. So something becomes true not because we find it out there, but how is it able to successfully fit in with our already established notions of truth, which in themselves already have you know pragmatic effects in the world? And can this new thing fit in with that in a smooth way that adds to our way of going through the world mm-hmm. smoothly, effectively. So, like, it's true because it's useful and it's useful because it's true. Like, those those are one and the same thing. Yeah, he says it's literally just the same. Yeah. And, look, he has this example where, like, take, like, a clock on the wall... Um, and you look at it and it says, I don't know, 2.30 p.m. But how can you know something to be a clock 
and trust in it when you haven't looked at the mechanism. You don't know how this mechanism works. Uh, so y- per that, you don't really know that that clock is an accurate representation of reality. Or how do you know that that clock works? Well, you do, not by like looking at the mechanism and checking that you know each second clicks on time and checking that the clock face is at the right position. It works to be, it works because it works to believe it's as a working clock. Yeah. Like, like we can use it without it frustrating or contradicting our experience. Yeah, like I say I'm going to pick you up at 11.30. We both look at our clocks. You look out your window, I'm there at 11.30. Yeah. We don't have – I mean, look, he, to be a bit nicer to him, like he does have a good example in this lecture where he says, well, how could it be the case that what is true is just like a good copy of the world? Mm. Because I certainly don't actually know how a clock works. Mm. So I literally cannot have a copy in my mind of how – I cannot have a representation of how a clock works in my mind. I just don't – I don't know that. And yet it is true that like it works – for you and I mm. to say we're going to meet at a certain time and then lo and behold, so my believing in, in the function of the clock as a timekeeping device leads me into agreement with other parts of my experience to mm. use his language. Yeah. But I don't know. What, what do you think of this idea? <sighs> Look, again, it's not untrue. I think just what he is describing uh, is not what philosophers mean by truth. And so, again, you can choose to say, yep, I like this, this is what I think truth is, or you can hold out to the more, you know, truth is a description, a copy of this already existing, inert, the way things actually are, quote-unquote, etc. Or you can have this more sort of, like, uh, subject-centric, no, it's about our experiences and whether things work and our experiences. Look, you can, t- you can take either. We're sort of like standing back and looking at these two paradigms and you can really just pick either um, to a certain extent. Um, He says that like truth is sort of like a wealth or health. It's the result of a process. It's not like you wouldn't say someone is wealthy because they have a lot of money. That's true only in a definitional sense. Someone is wealthy because they bought this stock 10 years ago, they made a wise investment, they save a lot, they have a lot of assets, etc. Like it's a result, their wealth is a result of processes. You wouldn't say someone is healthy because they have a well-functioning heart. Rather, they have a well-functioning heart because they eat well, they don't smoke, they run every day, etc. The truth is like those things. They're, they're a result of processes. And in the case of truth, it's the verification process. So I verify an idea by seeing whether or not it works for me in my goings on in the in the real world. Mm. Again, yeah, <laughs> yeah. This, yeah, I view this as the sort of thing where it's like, yeah, okay, like I can I can agree with that in as far in as much as you know, our like human experience goes, but that doesn't mean then that there isn't something that is like true as such that like through that verification process you come to know something that is true as such and not merely true, you know, because it works in relation to your other I agree. experiences. And what, what works in relation to our experiences is constrained by what is true as such. I mean, I can't believe that, like, there's not a wall there because I'm just going to walk into it. Um, to give a less, like, obvious example, I mean, I argued this in my, like, MA thesis that if we accept, like, ontologically, like, as per Aristotle, man is a social animal, that is a fact of our biology and our psychology, then if you adopt practices that are individualistic or practices that go against that fact of humans as such, you're going to have bad mental health outcomes, you're going to have bad social outcomes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, So what is true as such informs and constrains what is true in prag- pragmatic terms, I think. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. There's, uh, th- yeah, many things in here that are convincing on one level, but not convincing all the way. It's not wholly explanatory. Yeah. It's not pragmatism all the way down. Yeah. But there, there is something along, uh, here, um, 
where we get to something that's uh, related to education. So after this, he says, it's not just things relating to experience, but like the relations among purely mental ideas are another sphere where truth exists. Um, So your mental ideas, uh, your thoughts about the world and uh, say like mathematical truth or something, these exist in relation to one another in a sense, you know, like that, that, that can exist independently of your experience of the world, something like mathematical truth, but it exists relationally, right? Um, so like we relate abstract ideas with one another to create systems of truth under which sensory facts of experience arrange themselves. Um, and any idea that helps us deal with reality or doesn't kind of entangle us in any way, entangle us in our experience fits with reality i.e is true um but then like how do we form those sorts of ideas how can we come to those mental ideas mental models under which we can then sort of arrange and make sense of our sensory experiences well this is the part of educational importance or importance in educational philosophy all human thinking is discursified. All human thinking is uh, a product of, shaped by, constituted of, symbiotic with discourse, you know, talking and thinking and interacting with other humans about these ideas. So you... So, like, just earlier on, uh, still in this lecture, we were talking about, like, verification. So things come to be true through verifying them, verifying that experience. And he says that how how this works, how human thinking works, is that you lend and you borrow verifications from other people, right? So, like, going back to that, say, like, I don't know, clock example, I, I don't have to know how the mechanism of a clock works to trust it because someone else has already figured that out and I lend that, I borrow that verification from them and mm. then... In turn, I will then create new verifications just through any sort of experience and or any any sort of like thoughts or any any results of thinking that I've had, and then lend that off to other people. And that is how the system of all human thinking works. We exchange ideas, and through exchanging those ideas, we form new ideas, and it's a sort of like continual renewing, refreshing process, right? Truth gets built out in this way, sort of like verbally. Um, And this is very influential for education because through this idea you get the sense that, not the sense, you get the notion that um, students can construct knowledge with one another. That is pragmatism and in educational discourse it also gets called constructivism Mm -hmm. um so you know you can set up a class and you get one group of people they're talking about i don't know um let's say you're doing history class and uh you get you're, you're running a class on like the industrial revolution and you go, okay, class, I want you to figure out the consequences of the Industrial Revolution. This table over here, you do the social factors. This table over here, you do the political factors. This one over here, you do the economic. This one over here, you do cultural. And I remember doing that in school. <laughs> yeah, and then like, you do that, and each table looks at things on their own, um, looks at their own topic, and then once you've done that, you go off and you share it. You share it with everyone else. So that way you all construct your knowledge. You construct your full knowledge of the consequences of the Industrial Revolution together. And this can work in a way if everyone, this is the important part where it fails uh, in the way it's commonly implemented, if everyone is already on the same sort of like knowledge base, right? Yep. If you already, if you come into it knowing nothing, and you figure out, you, you know, you figure out your own thing in uh, whatever sort of impoverished way you can do it, uh, and then you gain, you, you listen to the other groups, and then you jot down like 
two, three dot points for each of their contributions, you're really like hardly better off than you were at the start of that process, right? Yeah. Because that's not... It, there's an assumption here that the way that we can that we get to knowledge and the way that we progress intellectually is through continually exercising sort of like higher order thinking skills. So, you know, it's like it says, like human thinking gets discursified. So like a big thing in um, progressive education, which is the tradition on which like Dewey and pragmatism and a lot of um, modern Western curriculums uh, are shaped with is that you have to continually practice these higher order thinking skills and when the f- kids need facts, well, you know, they can just Google that now. They can look it up. You know, you don't have to have the facts as long as you're exercising those higher order thinking skills because through doing that, you're better capable of um, constructing knowledge with everyone because you construct on that higher level, right? Mm-hmm. That's where that discourse happens. That's, and through that discourse, that's how that construction happens. But that's not how cognitive science works. <laughs> you start from lower order thinking skills and from that you build the higher ones. You need to know the facts about something before you can think about something, before you can really, you know, have a meaningful, informative, engaging discourse about it. I couldn't have rocked up to this without reading, you know, Pragmatism by William James and then, you know, had like a useful, informed and informative conversation about it. No one would be able to gain anything from this if I hadn't done that. Sounds like an undergraduate tutorial. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, like that's that's where the issue lies. Like you you build up knowledge. You know, you're only having those higher order thinking skills in as much as you're thinking about something and you need... Uh, you need to build those rote facts to do that. And, well, those rote facts... I mean, I, I guess a pragmatist, you know, you, you put this to William James and he says, no, like the construction of those facts and those truths themselves are discursive. Um, but the way it's commonly practiced is, you know, there's a there's a deep aversion to the idea of kids, you know, copying down facts from the board or facts from like a textbook or something. Like, no, you need to do like these fun things where you're like, do your higher order thinking skills and you figure this out on your own and you, then you can... You know, it it seems a bit yeah. idealistic. I mean, yeah. like as you said, like you have to first read the book, yeah, and then you can do this like critical higher order thinking. I mean, it's sort of like I had a similar conversation with a um a senior tutor <coughs> at university, and and I, I was making a similar point to this, mm. and he goes, "Yeah, I completely agree." Like he was teaching literature, and the literature syllabus, which he didn't construct, had like. Feminist critiques, Marxist critiques of like T. S. Eliot, and he was like, "That's fine. Like, I think there's a lot in those critiques, but the way that the class was structured is like you're just bombarding these first years who haven't read T. S. Eliot with critical perspectives on T. S. Eliot." Mm. And it's like, "Well, that how, that doesn't work. Like, as you're saying, like to do this higher level with this critical stuff." you actually need to know what you're critiquing. Mm. And it assumes that, like, and as a theory of education, it just seems to me, like, very optimistic that it is assuming that students will actually come to class prepared with the facts Mm. so that they can do this. I mean, I went to, like, a school that was built recently, and so it was, like, open plan. And the logic behind it sounds nice, but it's just optimistic about what students are actually like. In reality, it was incredibly noisy and it was incredibly hard to concentrate. <laughs> but in this like ideal picture of like what a high school should look like where students are quietly doing their work and if you know they want to walk from one class to the other or like overhear something going on in another class that like relates to their class and they learn more, that that's just not. I mean, I'd like, I was a good student, but I just got up and left class. <laughs> when I was bored, I just like walked, I just walked around school for 20 minutes. You could do that. No one said anything. I had oh, good right. marks, but like, <laughs> but that's, everyone did it. Like, you know, and this was at a, like a select entry school, you know, but like still, even in that environment, this optimistic view of, of education just like, you know, ran headfirst into the wall of reality. Yeah. But look, I, I 
like I alluded to, I feel like you could put this to, you know, William James and he'd say, no, 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 no. Like, look, that's, but, but you haven't, uh, you're not being truly pragmatic there because you're not focusing on the consequences. But I'm just saying the, the way that pragmatism has been used in education ends up being implemented in this way and having these consequences. So I think yeah, it's uh, fairly, I don't know, fairly useless as far as that's concerned. Yeah, I, I agree. It sort of reminds me of like, like the hardcore neoliberal, I mean, I almost respect it to an extent where they're like, no, 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 like the reason why the GFC happened was because we didn't get rid of enough regulation. Mm. We only got rid of like half the regulations. We need to get rid of all of them. And then this wouldn't have happened. Like mm. we need more free market. Like, dude, are you serious? Yeah. What's that quote by Einstein? Like the definition of insanity is just doing the same thing over and over again. <laughs> Expecting different results. Yeah, exactly. Anyways, lecture... Seven, on humanism, which was my favourite lecture, and the last lecture I took notes on because the last one I just thought he um, he just repeated himself. I, I liked this one because he sort of yeah, I wrote down this quote where he says the sensational and the relational parts of reality are dumb; they say absolutely nothing about themselves, which I love as someone who loves theory and philosophy because, you know, when you sort of get these like crude, vulgar empiricists like we just we just need to know facts and just read the news. Like, what, what does this have to do with the real world? Like, what, you know, like, how you interpret those... Like, those facts don't tell you anything. Like, you need to filter those facts to make sense of them and say, well, I think, like, X caused Y because of this theory, etc. Mm. Uh, so, like, I loved that. And at a certain point of this, what he means by humanism is just that, like, our view of the world is always infected with a human element. So we can't, like, as per Kant, we can't ever strike the noumenon in itself. We're always looking at it from a human perspective, so there's that element in it, in whatever we say is true. And similarly, this is like Barclay's point, but it leads Barclay to very different conclusions, where he says everything is just an idea in the mind of God. He goes, well, what are you talking about matter? Like, are you telling me matter is that which has no taste, no colour, no visible appearance? Like, if you talk about things absent of their sensible qualities... That's a nonsensical concept. So everything that actually exists is just a sensible quality, which, as it turns out, is in our mind. So it's a similar sort of thing to Barclay, really, but he... Oh, that just... I've Wait, okay. I've been struggling with Barclay. I've never actually read him, but, like, I keep hearing about Barclay. You're like, how could anyone think that? Yeah, and you just made it make complete sense for me. It does make complete sense, but you don't. But like, it could it can lead in one of two ways where you can say, okay, well, we just we can't ever know what the table actually looks like, or you can go, well, the table looks exactly like that in God's mind. That's pretty based. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I like it. I, I know I liked it too. Incidentally, the guy giving that class on Barclay, as he was giving it, was like was having a like conversion to Catholicism <laughs> from the position of previously being like a materialistic atheist. Mm. And like, it was so cool. Cause I like, I didn't know that. I didn't know that's what was going on at the time, but he would say things to that effect. And I got to like witness it in class. Mm. And then I later found out cause I saw a video of him on the Catholic church website <laughs> <laughs> where he talks about his conversion. And I was like, Oh shit. Like I like, wit- like, and he said it happened in 2019, which is when I did the class. And I'm like, why wow, that was like, when he was reading Barclay. <laughs> wow, that must be really interesting. It was a fascinating class. Yeah. yeah. Damn. I I feel like that's a fairly, I don't know how common, but that is uh, quite the uh, interesting move that has happened a couple of times. Like materialist atheist philosopher starts reading uh, religious tinged philosophy and then they just end up converting under the... Uh, intellectual yeah. weight of it they're like oh shit it's 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 not as stupid as sam harris told me it was <laughs> yeah uh, there's um I, I thought this was a pretty good lecture as well um and it this is sort of like rehashing his idea of truth a bit as well because like i said like he just keeps repeating himself in this but he he had like a example that i thought was pretty good so like when we talk about truth like capital t truth 
it's an abstraction of truths in the plural, like saying the law, like the law. Look, this is the law. You need to follow the law. And that that way of talking about things is like the law is something, it's just like it's one thing that exists out there. But the law is like a result. It's it's not like pre-existent. So like previous law and a new case becomes a new law via a judge. Like we, we pretend that we've uncovered something eternal and already existing w- mm. when we talk about the law. Yeah, he says but, that we confuse the names of things for the thing itself. Yeah, like, yeah, like it, it's not like something like pre-existent has just revealed itself to us. We've just put an abstract name on a process and the, the exact same thing is happening with truth as far as he's concerned. Yeah, and so like this is called like reification and so like we, we would reify like the law as if the law exists and stands over us and like all other laws are partaking in the law in a platonic sense. Like this is reification and pragmatists are against it. And so it's so a Marxist actually. Um, yeah. I mean, there's merit to that view. Mm. I just thought that was a good example. Um, very illustrative, but yeah, this, oh, there was another line in here um, unrelated to any of the philosophy as, as far <laughs> as I can tell. Yeah. But he just has this offhand remark where he's, um, I don't know, you think he's critiquing some idea and he says something like that. That would be like saying Filipinos uh, uh, are fit for self-government. Or he just has this line where he indicates that Filipinos aren't fit for governing themselves. Yeah. Which I thought was like, why did you put that in there? <laughs> yeah, I don't know what was going on in the year that he gave that. I mean, like it was a colony of the United States, right? Yeah, yeah. So I guess like a, in the historical context, that's something that might have been floating around politically. Yeah. But... I don't know. You just you read that from twenty twenty three, and you're like, "Well, it's true. Oh, yeah. It's it's untrue now, <laughs> but maybe it was true then." You know? <laughs> I mean, this is why. No, but like, this is why people criticize pragmatism, especially like Rorty's neo pragmatism, as mm. being relativism. Yeah, because what I just said is a joke. Like, they're sort of forced to say. Yeah. It's like, well, yeah, it's true now to us that, like, we we think that Western countries shouldn't colonize other countries, but, like, how are you going to say that that was, like, eternal? You can't say it's, like, eternally true that colonialism is bad or imperialism is bad. It's just, it sort of starts to take on, like, a, a tinge of relativism, which, like, most people just instinctively react against because it's fine to say it with, like, the case of, like, atoms, for mm. example, like remembering at the start of the podcast is it true or not whether atoms exist? Well, we couldn't prove it back then. We can prove it now. So maybe it became true. Mm. Did it become true that racism was bad? Like once you sort of apply this logic to like moral philosophy, I think it's, you run into a lot more problems. Yeah. But then again, with the racism example, it's like, well, our current way of thinking about like races wasn't even something that like existed. So it, it became a thing and then became bad. Yeah. Like, it's not like, I don't know, like, uh, I mean, it, it could be the case, but... Um, <coughs> I mean, look, uh, yeah, I mean... I, as far as, like, someone with this position is concerned, it isn't the case that, like, a European is, like, some, like, static category that has persisted through history. Well, look, I think I think this comes back to the to the to the point that, like, psychologically it's true. I mean, like, mm. yeah, like, if you go back to into the 1800s and if you were to like chastise an individual for not thinking the way we think now, I mean, that would be a nonsensical thing to do because Mm. you're correct in saying that like the concepts and the way that we view reality and we think of race as being a non-salient moral and social category um, to to just go back in time and like chastise one individual for not thinking the way we, we think now is just would just be a stupid a stupid thing to do, mm. um, and that's like it feels like an unproblematic thing to say when you're talking about the time span of like 500 years. But what about like 50 years, mm. or what about like five years? Um, so like maybe psychologically it's true, but then like the practice like is imperialism intrinsically bad. I think the pragmatist would just say, like, I disagree with, like, the way you phrased the question. Mm. I don't know. That would, sorry, that went on a bit of a tangent. No, nah, look, we're all about the tangents here. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. 
I'm a big fan of doing tangents. Um, but yeah, yeah, it seems that we just run into this thing where the pragmatists can sort of slip out the behind the back door. Yeah. Yeah. But look, then that just brings us to the final lecture, Pragmatism and Religion, where there's nothing new here pretty much. Um, he's just going back over the idea that faith and like religious belief has pra- pragmatic value in as much as it sort of like provides like meaning and, you know, spiritual and emotional importance to people, which has, you know, value in and of itself. Um, but again, you know, it's puts it in this weird position where you can, on the one hand, disagree with the like metaphysical premises that underlie religious belief, but at the same time be like, but it's still nice to have those benefits. Yeah. It's, it's sort of like, it feels like, I don't know, you, you work like a really bad corporate job and then you just get your weekly email about mindfulness <laughs> from HR. <laughs> That's how this feels for me philosophically. Yeah. This is, this is the mindfulness email. Yeah. On that note, Amazon, if you want to sponsor us. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> We're still open to that fracking sponsorship. Yeah. Fracking is bad, but it is nice that they pay us a lot of money. Mm. Uh, there, there was something odd that he says here where he talks about um, salvation and like the the idea of salvation uh, in religious thought and whether or not that's you know, like a pessimist would say like, no, that's not something you can bring to reality. And an optimist would say, no, like salvation is something that we can bring about in the real world. And he says that, well, uh, we're talking about possibility here you know pragmatism is about possibility so like as actual conditions approach of something approach complete approach let me redo that as actual conditions approach completeness the possible becomes a better and better grounded possibility so when the conditions are entirely complete it ceases to be a possibility and then has turned into like an actual fact or state of affairs right so the conditions of worldly salvation you know, like religious, however you want to conceive salvation, partly exists um, and would come to pass should all conditions come about, Mm. right? So he says that, like, everybody has, you know, ideals, ideals about how the world uh, should be, uh, ideals about how they should act in a moral sense, and that, well, everybody can bring about those ideals and each realised ideal is a step towards the world's salvation, so through our acts, we can create the world's salvation. But be the change know. you want to see. Yeah, yeah. I don't. But yeah, this I, uh, well, I I'm actually, convinced by it. I don't know. Like I it, actually it just, liked it. I I like this was the metaphysics that like underpinned my thesis on confusion freedom. Because mm. I was like, how the hell is freedom possible in a political philosophy that like has no conception of free will? Mm. And I grounded it in, like, their metaphysics. And I'm going to, like, read this quote from James where he says, For rationalism, reality is ready-made and complete for all eternity, while for pragmatism it is still in the making and awaits parts of its complexion from the future. So this idea of, like, reality being dynamic and, like, our observation of it, our interaction with it is co-constitutive of, of reality. It's not We're not passively observing it and copying it is actually a bit of like a bi-directional <clears throat> interplay here. And through that process, like, we bring about the future. So there's like, I got that from like Confucianism. They're like, well, not Taoism, more, more precisely, like that's where that metaphysics comes from. You can like re, well, if that's possible, then like the future is not completely closed off. Like there's a possibility to use James's term like we have possibilities and if we act a certain way we can play a very small part in like steering the future towards that particular ideal it's not this like hardcore i think you can get it in either materialism or rationalism that like history is just this like series of events that is playing out which was already predetermined by what happened before it because there's dynamic process and things happen and change the course of events and so i liked this part of pragmatism um right right i you may be more sympathetic to it with your sort of confucian taoist framing because when i read the part about like 
you know, us realizing our ideals or steps towards the world's salvation, it just made me think of like Lenin. I was like, well, right. there was a dude like realizing his ideals and, you know, read to like a civil war and the red terror. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think it's got a pragmatic value and that's probably why he endorses it. Because if you think that like by being a good person and if you think that like small acts of kindness actually matter. Right. Yeah. Then you're going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm more sympathetic to that part then. But look, that about wraps up the lecture series. Yep. Um, any final thoughts? Any final comments? Um, look, I'm not going to call myself pragmatist anytime soon. I think his view on truth is just a semantic, like, yeah, I think he's just talking about something else. Mm. Uh, and I think it's, there's still a role to play for like truth as such and reality as it actually exists and the role of philosophy in being this like conceptual apparatus and uh, tuning that conceptual apparatus, I'm still very much wedded to the importance of that. Mm. Uh, yeah, so yeah, it was okay. Mm. I think if there are things about that that you liked and enjoyed, just read nature. Just read nature. It's just yeah. better. Like, yeah, you get like like similar sort of some similar standpoints and conclusions, but I feel in a way that's more philosophically interesting and a lot more engaging. Mm. Well, that is our ex- next episode. Bum, bum, bum. Nietzsche, the birth of tragedy. I'm very keen. Get pumped. I know I'm pumped. We are ready to bring about the birth of tragedy. I have no expectations, which is probably a good thing, because whenever I read something with expectations, it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm trying to go into this like completely neutral. Uh, if you've listened this far into the podcast, you're a special beast indeed. Hello, Rudy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> please rate us on whatever app you use to listen to this. Five stars. Five stars. Don't give us one star. Don't do that. Um, Not even four. Not even four. Five. And share us. Help promote the visibility of the podcast. Go tell everyone you know about it. Exactly. When you're at work, corner someone on their, you know, coming back from their lunch break. (laughs) So they they have to get back to work. Have you listened to this? You you know, socially corner them, put them in a situation where it's very tough for them to leave and say, you need to listen to this podcast and just hammer them until you see them download it on their phone. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a good day.